signs of sepsis or septic shock. So you want to take a blood specimen to investigate whether bacteria is present in the blood. So as you take that specimen and then you take the specimen for analysis in the lab, is your sterilization and disinfection process accurate such that when you say you have isolated Staphylococcus epidermidis, those are one of the bacteria that are found on the skin, but can actually be a pathogen if it gets into the uh, body, for example, in blood. So when you give a lab report that this patient has staph epidermidis from the blood, is it accurately from the blood specimen or there was contamination from the needle, okay? Or from the skin as you are taking the blood specimen. So how valid are your tests, okay? How accurate are they? And then these two processes also are the cornerstone of infection control. Infection control in a hospital setup or in a research facility is very, very important because one, by having proper infection control, you're able to reduce the incidences of nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections are hospital acquired infections. So for your patients who are the main clientele that you're handling in a hospital setup, you don't want to expose them to other infections on top of the disease that they are dealing with, okay? You've, been, you've admitted somebody with malaria. You don't want them to develop pneumonia in your facility because of a lapse in your uh, processes, okay? So infection control. In a research facility, you're handling some pathogenic um, material. You don't want the staff who are within the research facility or members of the public who come in as visitors, you don't want to expose them to certain pathogens because of a lapse in your sterilization and disinfection processes. If you're uh, getting rid of clinical waste or research waste, okay, is it properly decontaminated before you release it to a waste disposal system? Because you don't want to expose the community to infection because of the kind of waste that you're churning out from your research facility or your hospital. So infection control, the cornerstone of infection control is sterilization and disinfection. Okay, so in a hospital setup, you want to protect against nosocomial infections. These are hospital acquired infections, infections that your patients can get within your facility or members of the public as they come into uh, the hospital setup they can also be exposed to infection. So you want to uh, make sure your infection control policies are properly in place and are observed well, because this is a point of litigation. Besides the risk of, you know, you're exposing your patient to higher mortality, uh, I mean, uh, an increased risk of mortality or prolonged morbidity because of an extra infection, you are also at risk of being sued, all right? For you as a healthcare worker, as a doctor, you need to have proper protection, personal protective equipment, okay? So that you can perform your duties well. You do not want to get sick as the doctor who's handling this patient. You also don't want to expose your patient to infection from another patient, okay? And this you can achieve if you observe proper sterilization and disinfection, okay? So um, some definition of some terms that we will come across as we go through this discussion. One is uh, cleaning. And cleaning in the context of sterilization and disinfection is about removal of organic matter or debris, which can be uh, needles of infection. This can contribute to proliferation of bacteria and viruses. And cleaning as a prerequisite to disinfection and sterilization is usually done using uh, certain chemicals that are called enzymatic detergents, okay? So I'm not talking about cleaning using basic soap and water. I'm talking about cleaning using enzymatic detergents, some special detergents that have enzymes that can break down organic matter. You will see that for some of these processes like disinfection where you're using chemicals to disinfect a surface, the efficacy of the chemical disinfectant can be reduced if the, the item that you want to disinfect or the surface that you want to disinfect is heavily uh, contaminated with organic matter. So you may be required to clean first using an enzymatic detergent. Then after cleaning, you use the chemical disinfectant for you to achieve proper uh, efficacy. 
Um, we're we going to see some of those enzymatic detergents, detergents are just in brief, some examples. Now disinfection, what is disinfection? Disinfection is reducing the number of contaminating organisms to a level which is deemed no longer harmful to health. Your goal in disinfection is to kill microorganisms. Okay, you want to kill them. But if you just compare that with the uh, definition of sterilization, sterilization, your goal also is to kill microorganisms. But in sterilization, you are killing all. You're getting rid of absolutely all microorganisms. Okay, in disinfection, you may have some microorganisms still present, but the numbers, the numbers that are present are no longer harmful to health. Again, there's some microorganisms that have a very high intrinsic resistance, okay? Just like human beings or other living organisms, microorganisms or bacteria, if we narrow down to bacteria, they differ, the species or the strains differ in terms of their intrinsic or their natural resistance to killing agents. These agents can be um, chemical disinfectants, ETC. So because of that uh, difference in their intrinsic resistance, it means some are more hardy than others. Therefore, you may need a stronger disinfectant to kill a more hardy microorganism compared to one that has a less intrinsic resistance. Okay, so based on that, when you have knowledge of the kind of microorganisms you're dealing with, if it is a research setting, you're dealing with anthrax, okay, compared to a, a, a routine diagnostic lab where you're dealing with um, you, you, you're dealing, you're, you're trying to decontaminate a, a laboratory surface after you have carried out processes with uh, vegetative bacteria like uh, E. coli, Proteus, ETC. The kind of disinfectant chemicals that you're going to pick uh, to use to carry out your disinfection will be guided by the intrinsic resistance of that microorganism, okay? And I'm going to show you a slide on that. So just looking at the definition, the main difference between disinfection and sterilization here, in sterilization, you are killing all organisms. In disinfection, you are reducing the number. The goal is the same, you're killing all, okay? Now this chemical called an antiseptic is a type of disinfectant that can be used on living tissue. When we will look at uh, disinfection as a subtopic and narrow down to chemical disinfectants, you'll appreciate that you can broadly classify them to chemical disinfectants that can be used on the environment or on inanimate surfaces and disinfectants that are safe to use on living tissue, like the skin or on mucous membrane, okay? You've seen some, some of these mouthwashes that are used uh, have uh, chlorohexidine or another, any other chemical that is not corrosive to the skin. So you can't use any disinfectant on the skin. The special ones that can be used on living tissue are called antiseptics, okay? And we are going to see some examples of that. So we appreciate that in the process of disinfection and sterilization, and if the class rep is present, please, just in case I go off there because of network or any other technical issue, please alert me through my phone. You have my phone number, so just call me. I may not realize, and I don't want to talk to myself. So just give me that alert in case you lose me because of connection or something else. Okay, so the goal of sterilization and disinfection is measurement of microbial death. I mean, the, the goal is microbial death. You want to kill these organisms. And for whatever process you're carrying out, it is good to have a measure of efficacy, all right? How sure am I that I'm actually reducing the number of these microorganisms? So measurement of microbial death is important. This is necessary for validation uh, of all methods to demonstrate the required degree of microbial kill. So in microbial death, when you're killing these microorganisms, there are two important variables in whatever process or chemical that you uh, use in sterilization and disinfection. The two variables are one, the concentration of the killing agent. The killing agent could be heat, if you're using heat method for sterilization. Okay, so the concentration of that heat there, in that case would be the temperature. So what is the concentration of the killing agent? If it is a chemical you're using, for example, isopropyl alcohol to disinfect the skin, what is the concentration of that killing agent? Okay, that is recommended to be used at 70% isopropyl alcohol to disinfect skin before venipuncture. So that concentration is important. As far as chemicals are concerned, 
the appropriate concentration of the killing agent is usually provided by the manufacturer in the biosafety data sheet, okay? Because this is something that they have standardized. It has gone through the uh, quality control lab and there's the standard percentage, the, the standard concentration that is optimal for that killing to take place. Please be guided by that. Don't think that more is, more is better, okay? If the optimal concentration for a chemical for it to be used as a disinfectant, stick to 40%. If you go above that, you may be now exceeding the toxicity level, all right? Remember, there's the biosafety data sheet that looks at the safe concentration. So always use that appropriate concentration. Again, if you go below that, you may not be, uh, you will not achieve the appropriate uh, concentration that is used, that is required for microbial death to occur. So if, you, if a chemical is recommended by the manufacturer to be used at 40%, stick to 40, don't use 45, don't dilute it to 35, all right? Because you will not achieve the optimal concentration that is required for microbial death. The other important variable is the length of time that the agent is applied, okay? So if you are killing, uh, you want to sterilize a cotton swab and you want to use an autoclave and you want to set this autoclave to 136 degrees or 121 degrees centigrade, for how long should you expose that swab to that temperature for you to be sure that you have actually killed all vegetative bacterial cells or all spores for that matter, okay? So the time is important. If you're, if it's, you're supposed to run it, if it is 121 degrees and you've run the autoclave for 15 minutes, then you have achieved that microbial death and you have external quality control measures to check that. If you decide to set it to 121 degrees and to stop it after five minutes, you will not have achieved the microbial death that you want to achieve because you have shortened the time. Because these two variables, concentration and time, actually give you the dosage that you are using to kill your microorganisms, okay? Now, this relationship is inverse, the number of survivors after you have carried out your process, how many microorganisms have survived, okay? It's an inverse relationship, the number of survivors and the concentration of that killing agent and the time you have exposed your surface or your item to that killing agent. It's an inverse relationship. And we're talking about number of survivors because it is easier to, to, to document how many microorganisms have survived. It's easier to count the living cells, okay? Compared to the number that have died. It's easier to carry out processes to determine presence of life, okay? Than it is to carry out processes to determine. Okay, so I can take a piece of cotton swab and expose it to a process to determine whether there are any living cells on it, whether there are any microorganisms on it, whether there are any bacterial cells growing on it. Okay, so number of survivors. If it is a new chemical that is being rolled out into the market and with COVID, those came out. I remember if, if you watch news, there was a time when Kenya Bureau of Standard released a list of chemicals that they had banned and said they are misleading, they're not effective. Some of them, when you read the labels, you see that it kills 99% or kills all microorganisms. And when you use the word all in science, it's very, very you put that on your label and say kills all fungi, all viruses, all bacteria, all parasites. That is very, very important because if you are churning out such an agent, whoever is using it should be confident that any microorganism can be killed. But if it goes through the Bureau of Standards Quality Control is sufficient to kill bacteria, but it cannot kill viruses, then it means you're misleading the public. And based on that, your, your chemical can be withdrawn from the market. You can even be sued, okay? So uh, when a new chemical is being released into the market, and I'm making this to chemical because that's the most common, common agent that is used in these processes of sterilization and disinfection. But from this lecture, we will see that there are other things that we can use for killing microorganisms besides chemical agents, okay? But when you're releasing a new chemical, into the market, uh, it goes through the bureau standards and they check 
if it can kill all microorganisms, if it can't kill all, which kind of microorganisms can survive? Are they bacteria, virus? And what is the rate of microbial death? Okay, so if you have 100 bacterial cells and you expose it to 30% of that chemical, how many bacterial cells survive? Okay, if you expose it to 50%, how many survive? If you expose it to 70%, a more concentrated of that chemical, how many survive? And if this chemical then kills all bacteria at 70%, what is the toxicity level? How safe is it to use it on the skin, for example? So it is a balance that has to be attained by the bureau standards in the quality control uh, to make sure that the toxicity level is safe and you're actually killing the microorganisms, okay? So therefore now you say this chemical can be used at 60% or at 100%, it cannot be diluted or it can be used at 10%, okay? About the innate resistance of microorganisms and the level of disinfection. When we look at these examples of disinfectant chemicals, you're going to see that we can classify them as high level disinfectant, intermediate level or low level based on their strength. So high level disinfectants, okay, are stronger chemicals compared to the low level disinfectants, okay? Now, if you are uh, doing some work that uh, involves bacterial spores, okay? And uh, maybe this was discussed or you have not looked at it yet. Spores, bacteria, we have different types of bacteria. There are the vegetative bacteria and the spore forming bacteria. Basically bacteria, are going to form spores as a matter of survival, okay? When you have, um, when these bacteria do not have adequate nutrition or the temperatures have gone beyond the optimal, they become, they change into the spores, the spore forms that enables them to survive in very, very uh, hard, uh, in an environment that is uh, not conducive for their survival. When the environment changes, for example, their microenvironment, when the temperature goes back to the optimal temperature for growth, they have sufficient uh, water or moisture, then they are able to change from the spore forming to the vegetative state, okay? So formation of spores is a survival state. And when you have the spores forming, uh, you're not able to get rid of them compared to the vegetative bacterial state. So if you have bacteria in a spore state, for example, Bacillus anthracis, Clostridium tetina, these are important bacterial pathogens that cause, uh, for the examples I've given, they cause anthrax, tetanus, which are important diseases. If you want to get rid of these bacteria and they're in the spore, spore state, you need to use a stronger chemical as a disinfectant, a high level disinfectant compared to the vegetative state of that bacteria. So the basic rule of thumb here is that more resistant chemicals, I mean, more resistant microorganisms, organisms that have a higher innate resistance would require a higher level of, a higher strength of chemicals to be used for disinfection processes, okay? Or you can only get rid of them using sterilization processes. This is basically the rule of thumb you'd use in a laboratory setup where you're trying to design which chemical you can use. Labs can be classified as level one, level two, level three, level four, based on the risk of infection and the kind of work that is going on. If you're handling material, for example, from patients who have Ebola or other infectious, highly infectious uh, uh, pathogens, the kind of lab that you'd need to do that work would be different compared to somebody handling material from a patient who has Vibrio cholera, for example, because of the risk of infection and the amount, the type of chemical you'd need to use to decontaminate or to disinfect the surface after your processes, okay? So that this would definitely guide you. And based on this, then you would need, if you're in the infection control team, you can give gui some guidance on the type of chemical you'd pick to carry out your disinfection process or if you just need to carry out sterilization to decontaminate your surface after you have handled this uh, material. 
so I talked of personal protection and here it's in the context of carrying out disinfection or sterilization, okay? And here I'm talking about safety while handling chemical sterilants or disinfectants. Some of these chemicals are corrosive, okay? And there's that risk of getting some, uh, some, some injury because of surpassed toxicity level. So you need to have proper PPEs when handling some of these chemicals. Usually this, is, this information is provided in the biosafety data sheet that comes from the manufacturer, okay? So if you want to uh, fumigate a room that had some patients, uh, smallpox patients, for example, you want to use glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde to fumigate that room, what kind of PPEs should you have, okay? Uh, to protect your mucous membrane, because if you inhale too much formaldehyde, you know, the formalin, if you inhale too much of it, you're going to have some irritation in your mucous membrane, okay? If there's a splash that occurs in your eye as you're uh, diluting the chemical, what kind of steps do you need to take, okay? So before you handle a chemical safety data sheet that comes from the manufacturer, so that you have the appropriate PPEs, and this can be special gowns, this can be eyewears, goggles to protect the eyes, this can be masks for the nose, okay, masks with a face shield, gloves, and if it is gloves, what kind of gloves, okay, are they rubber gloves or are they special gloves, okay, cups, chemical goggles, etc. So what kind of PPEs do you need? And then two, in the event of exposure to this chemical, beyond the safety level toxicity, if somebody uh, if there's a splash in the eye or somebody inhales a chemical, they just open the lid and fumes come out and they inhale it and suddenly they are choking. What can you do? What do you need to do? Okay. Or if somebody consumes it by mistake, thinking it's water, what do you need to do? So that is provided in the biosafety data sheet and very, very important when you're dealing with chemical disinfectants or chemical sterilizers. So going back to cleaning, which I mentioned, uh, as an important prerequisite for some of these uh, processes, especially when you're dealing with chemical or chemical disinfectants or sterilants, you need enzymatic detergents to carry out cleaning. The goal, basically, we are saying that it is a soil removal process. You're getting rid of organic matter, okay? Um, for surfaces within a hospital setup in the ward, for example, you, carry out cleaning to get rid of obviously soiled uh, surfaces. You know, you may have blood spillage, uh, you may have vomitus if your patient is vomiting, you may have diarrhea. Those are some of the medical wastes that, you're, that can be present within the hospital environment that you, ne you need to get rid of because those waste matter are an important source of infection to other people who may come into contact with them. So you may need to clean your medical items, forceps, etc., before you disinfect them or sterilize them, or you may need to clean the environment, environmental surfaces that are contaminated with medical waste. And for all of these processes, you need to use enzymatic detergents, okay? Besides using the enzymatic detergents, um, you may need to use a material which you soak into the detergent and wipe surfaces. Okay, it is preferable that right now what is preferred is the microfiber material instead of cotton. Okay, so let's look at these enzymatic detergents. These enzymatic detergents are basically enzymes that have, uh, are basically detergents that have enzymes which are proteases that can break down proteins, amylases that can break down carbohydrates, lipases that can break down fats, and cellulose, cellulose that can break down cellulose. Okay, um, these detergents can be diluted in water and used to wipe down floors, walls, or environmental surfaces, or you dilute it in containers like buckets and you soak your items like forceps uh, or, or any other device that could be contaminated with organic matter, visible organic matter, okay? You soak them in the detergents, then you, 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 you take them through the process of disinfection or sterilization, okay? You just need to make sure that whatever items you're putting in to be um, 
to go through the enzymatic detergent cleaning process is compatible. It is safe. Some of the medical items have small, uh, small connection points. So you just need to read through it very well to make sure that you're, you're dealing with, uh, you're observing compatibility. You don't want to destroy your equipment or small gadgets by exposing them to something that they are not compatible with. Usually read, read the uh, guiding manufacturers sheet first for the item and also for these detergents. The biosafety data sheet tells you what it is contra indicated for so that you don't destroy your medical items or small devices, okay? Now, some of these detergents come as single enzyme. Uh, for example, this one here, you can see it's indicating that it has a protease enzyme only. So it will destroy all proteins, but if your surface has organic matter that are carbohydrates or uh, fats, lipases, they will not be destroyed, okay? So it can be single enzyme, or dual or multi-enzyme having four. Of course, this one is the most expensive, having the four different enzymes, but it is the best because it destroys all types of organic matter instead of uh, getting of dual enzyme, okay? Again, it depends on what your goal is. This could be appropriate for a research facility, okay? That has a target, you know, you're dealing mainly with uh, proteins. Okay. Are we together, class? Yes. yes. Hello, class. We are good. Okay. I'm just checking. All right. Now, um, for somebody who would be part of the infection control team, you know, monitoring processes is very, very important. It's not enough to give instruction on what needs to be done in a ward environment, for example. Uh, giving instruction is one important thing. The second thing is providing the appropriate PPEs and the appropriate chemicals for the staff who are carrying out that cleaning or disinfection process. The third and most important thing is monitoring, monitoring that process to make sure things are being carried out as they're supposed to. There are three approaches that you can do to monitor environmental cleaning. And cleaning of the environment is very, as nosocomial infection is concerned, hospital acquired infection. In a hospital setup, having a clean environment is important. And when I say clean here, I'm not just talking about clean in terms of visible cleanliness. I'm talking about clean in the context of infectious pathogens, all right? Having that is safe, Okay, that your patients and the workers are not at risk of getting exposed to infectious agents, whether it is in the air, whether it is um, through the water system, whether it is on the wall, whether it is on the surfaces, on your office desk, your pens, your notebooks, your request forms, etc. They need to be, when I talk about environmental cleanliness and safety, think of it that way with microscopic eyes or with a microscopic mind beyond what you can see. Okay, now for environmental cleaning monitoring, three approaches can be used. Visual inspection, part of the infection control team, and infection control team can also include doctors as well. Visual inspection during the process of cleaning and post cleaning. So active visual inspection and providing feedback to the frontline staff. Okay, I think that is self explanatory, inspecting them as they do it and after. The second one is fluorescence, which is a process measure. There are chemical marker pens that are available and this special test when you expose them to UV light, okay? So what you can do is to touch, uh, use these chemical markers to touch uh, this, to mark these high touch surfaces, okay? This is somebody's ward room and you can see all these different um, available, okay, including the file and all these surfaces that are present. These are high touch surfaces that can be used and they need to be wiped down using the enzymatic detergents and disinfectants. It is easy to ignore this. Some things that are missing here that would be present also would include a mobile phone. If there's a TV here for control for the TV, okay.
Sorry, I think I lost connection. I'll just project my slides again. Sorry for that. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Can. Yeah, sorry, I lost connection but I'm back. So I was showing you this picture. Did you see this picture? I was here. High touch surfaces. Yeah, we saw it. High touch, yeah. all right, okay. So what I was talking about this chemical marker pen that you can use to touch, uh, just put a mark on these surfaces, let the cleaning and disinfection take place. Then you come with a UV light and you shine it. If it was not wiped down, then it's going to fluoresce. And this is something you can do with the Metron or the frontline staff in charge of cleaning and disinfection. And they can see that those surfaces are actually being ignored and are not being cleaned, okay? So this is a, a, how you can monitor using fluorescence. And culturing, culturing can also be used. And this is mainly confined to outbreak investigations because it is very, very expensive and it is targeting a certain pathogen. For example, you have the burn ward, the burns ward where we have patients who have burn wounds and you have an outbreak of pseudomonas. Almost all the patients, pseudomonas are one of the notorious bacteria that cause nosocomial infection, hospital acquired infections. So suddenly you have a lot of um, uh, the wounds, pseudomonas and you suspect there is something wrong. Is it some of the cotton swabs that you're using or some of the disinfectant chemicals? Because if early quoting and picking some of the chemical actually put in things into the uh, container with the disinfectant, it can actually be the source of infection. And for some bacteria like pseudomonas that are highly, highly resistant, they can actually reside and multiply in diluted disinfectant chemicals. So for outbreak investigations, you're trying to work backwards to find out what is the source of this bacteria. Is it from the patient? Is it from the, the staff? Okay. People are not washing their hands well. They're not uh, disinfecting their hands. People are poking their noses as they handle surfaces. So they are introducing MRSA, okay, staph aureus. So you're trying to work backwards to a source. Maybe the water supply in the hospital is contaminated. So this culturing is where you take swabs of the wounds that are infected, or you take the items. They could be forceps that were processed in a certain day. The autoclave was not working well, so they did not get properly decontaminated. So they are the source of infection. You work backwards, trying to find out the source of that outbreak, and you have a target. You know what you're trying to look for either from the environment or from the, staff, from the staff, okay? It can also be from a patient. It can be as an individual patient, an index patient, okay? Within the ward, people are admitted with different conditions or they are sharing bathroom facilities. And that's one patient is the source of infection with a certain pathogen to other patients. So culture is useful looking for certain bacterial mm -hmm or viral in pathogen, and you're looking for the source. Very expensive, therefore confined or, or mainly helpful in an outbreak. In Okay. Now there's something called Spalding's classification, which is very, very useful in the standards, looking at disinfection and sterilization 
processes, the practice or the processes of disinfection and sterilization, folding classification system, we basically look at the degree of risk of infection. What is the degree of risk of infection? And based on this degree of risk of getting infected or of these patients getting infection, we classify processes or devices or equipment as critical, non-critical, okay? So the Spalding classification system classifies healthcare devices, equipment or medical processes as critical, semi-critical or non-critical based on the degree of risk of infection. For the critical items or processes where you require sterility, there's no shortcut, no two way around it, you require sterilization. And these are items, medical devices, equipment or processes that are get, getting into sterile tissue. For example, the vascular system, the central nervous system. Okay, these are places that do not have normal flora. Okay, such that if anything process or after using this item, okay, and you are able to isolate <laughs> a microorganism from there, you need to follow it up to its logical conclusion because this is a surface or a place or a tissue that is normally sterile. Okay. Think of surgical instruments or equipment or accessories that you use to take a tissue biopsy. So you're carrying out an investigation for cancer. You need to take a tissue biopsy from the breast, for example. So we inside the breast tissue, you do not have normal flora, okay? So if you're going to use a surgical blade, forceps or any other item or, or device, that is contaminated, it means you're going to introduce microorganism into a, a, a place that is normally sterile, okay? And that is wrong. That is going to be the beginning of another problem. So any critical item or process that is classified as critical requires uh, you to observe sterilization. Now, most of these surgical instruments, accessories, ETC, come prepackaged from the manufacturer, they are sealed, they are single use, they are marked sterile. For those that can be reused, for example, forceps, okay? You can use a forcep on a patient, use it on another patient. From one patient, between each patient, they have to undergo sterilization processes. And they can be sterilized by steam, for example, in an autoclave, or if there are items that cannot withstand moisture or cannot withstand heat, they can be sterilized using sterilized, sterilized gases. For example, ethylene oxide. They go through, through uh, a process that would sterilize them using these chemicals like ethylene oxide gas. So examples of these items like biopsy forceps, urinary catheters, these are single use items. A patient, it comes from the manufacturer. It is marked sterile. Once you break the seal, you use it on a patient and then it is discarded. You cannot use it on another patient, okay? Implants, needles, but for things that can be reused, I've said you need to take them through a sterilization process, okay? The next group items, the next class in the Spalding classification, critical then semi-critical. And remember, we are looking at the degree of risk of infection. If you're getting into somewhere that is normally sterile, the degree of risk of infection is very high. That is where we are observing strict sterility. The next is the semi-critical semi -critical items. Now for these items, you require level of disinfection because the risk of infection is significantly high, okay? If you can access items that are sterile, the better use them, but if you cannot, use items that have undergone high level disinfection. And these are items that come into contact with non or mucous membranes, okay? Items that come into contact with non-intact skin or mucous membrane. You know the skin is the uh, one of the barriers, one of the barriers against the infection. If you have a breach on the skin, Okay, then your first line of defense, one of your first lines of defenses has gone down. Okay, the mucus significantly high risk 
of infection, the mucous membrane within your oral cavity, for example, or in your nose or in your rectum, etc. There's a significantly higher risk of infection in the mucous membrane compared to intact skin, compared to the surface of the skin. Pop and put it on the skin, the risk of infection is not as high as taking a thermometer and putting it in the, uh, in, 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 in the patient's, uh, in, the, in the rectum, for example, okay? In the anal cavity. The risk of infection is higher in the mucous membrane compared to so think of respiratory therapy equipment, anesthesia equipment, laryngoscopes, bronchoscopes, GI endoscopes, cystoscopes, vaginal ultrasonic probes, diaphragm fitting rings, etc. These are things that come into contact with the mucous membrane. If you can use item generalization, okay? Remember some of these things are shared within patient, from one patient to another. So you can reuse them. If you cannot sterilize them then you, and you're disinfecting them to reduce chances of infection, then use high level disinfectant chemicals. And for all of these items, because it's exposed to organic matter, if you are using high level disinfectant chemicals, you need to clean them first. Cleaning process must precede high level disinfection. And remember you're cleaning with the enzymatic detergent. Okay, your goal here is to reduce reduce the last one are the non-critical -criti items that require a low level disinfection because the risk the degree of risk of infection here is significantly quite low and these are items that come into contact with intact skin intact skin for example blood pressure cuffs okay on the arm to take blood pressure measurements stethoscopes uh, mobile patient equipment, for example, trolleys where you put a patient, uh, wheelchairs where the patient sits on. These are individuals who are sick. These are items that are being used in a hospital setup, which are being used out there in the community or at home. It is for mobility of the patients within the hospital setup. So the patient is sitting on it. Okay, maybe they have a gown, a hospital gown. So their skin is coming into contact with it wheelchair or you're using a trolley or you're taking blood pressure measurements of this okay. intact skin. So these are there's still a risk of infection because pathogens can exist on the skin of a patient. And if you're taking blood pressure of a patient, another patient comes in or you, you, I don't know if you've gone to the ward yet, the wards for rotations, not yet, but you have been patients at one point or the other. You see the nurse. Please, we have too much background. Kindly mute, kindly mute your microphone, whoever has a microphone on. Kindly mute, or if you've gone to the washroom, kindly mute your microphone. Or class rep, class rep, if you can mute uh, whoever's microphone is on, that would help, please. Oh, so we have normal flora that exists on the skin, skin, and this can be transmissible from one person to another. So much as you're uh, using, uh, you're, you're not getting into the mucous membrane or this is uh, intact skin, it is wise that you disinfect some of this equipment like blood pressure cuffs, okay? From one patient to another, done routinely. And even when you're taking temperature right now with COVID, people have learned and have tried to have, uh, avoid contact as much as possible. So most facilities have the infrared thermometers, but growing up, you may recall that some of these facilities and even in the rural setups now, when, when you go back, you still find the thermometers that are put in the armpit and these are shared. You need to disinfect that, okay? Wipe it down with alcohol before you put it on the next patient. There's a risk of transmitting some pathogen from one patient to another. So because the risk of infection is not so high, you can use the low level. Uh, 
uh, different processes that can be used for sterilization. I want us to just look at some examples of sterilization processes and disinfection processes, and then we, we go into infection control, okay? How we can carry out infection control in a hospital setup. So sterilization, there are different methods of sterilization. And the choice of the method you'll use, one depends on the volume of items that you want to sterilize, the compatibility of those items and the method that you're picking. Some of those items are destroyed by heat. So you cannot use heat on all items. Some of them can be corroded when you use certain chemicals, okay? Some of them are liquids that you cannot boil because they have biological material. So when you expose them to heat, things that they contain, so in that case, you'll use a physical method like filtration, okay? For some of these items in an industry, it is large scale. You are producing thousands of surgical blades per day. You cannot put them in small heat containers. Uh, so what is more feasible is to use a physical method like radiation using gamma to sterilize large items, and then you seal them so that they come prepackaged sealed and marked sterile. So the choice of the method of sterilization that you use will be guided by some of those factors that I have mentioned, okay? Just to point out some of them, the examples, heat is a common method, all this method has been used, it's very, very convenient to use, especially in a laboratory setup where you're sterilizing different gadgets as you process clinical specimen and also sterilizing mm different items that you're using in the laboratory. Uh, for example, laboratory glassware, wire loops, faucet points, you, where you use the red heat, okay? You put the item in the flame, it, the heat will uh, heat up the, 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 the wire loop, for example, you're going to see it's going to turn red hot and any microorganism that could have been present on the item will be killed. In the industrial setup, high is mainly for very, very large item, a large number of items that you, you want to sterilize. So heat can be dry heat, which is basically hot air that is heated up or moist heat, moist heat where you're using an autoclave, okay? An autoclave is the oldest heat gadget that has been used. And basically it's about using steam to kill microorganisms. Okay, now what is unique about it is that it is a pressurized vessel, so you can increase the temperature of steam. Steam is basically water that has turned into air vapor when it gets to the boiling point. But now in an autoclave, because you're using it in a pressurized vessel, you, when you increase the pressure, you increase the temperature of the steam. Okay, it's a very useful gadget in the laboratory. Um, next to theater, okay, in surgery, in surgical departments next to theater, the autoclave is a very, very useful uh, machine. In that case, it's very, very big. So, okay, there isn't uh, a lot of risk to the workers who are using it. Uh, we'll see from But for the autoclave, once you maintain the machine well, uh, how to set the temperature correct, set the temperature cor correct, isn't risk to the worker. They can only get burnt if they open and close it properly. Okay. So auto in terms of sizes, shape. Uh, so some of them are large scale. Most of the current ones are automated. Once you just set the temperature that you want, the timer, okay? And it has an inbuilt quality control that uh, comes with each process once it ends. So you can actually see whether the correct temperature was attained and if it rained for the correct time. We have the external quality control that you need to incorporate, which uh, I'm talking about monitoring autoclave. So you can see the different sizes. There are some that are very small in dental uh, surgical offices that can 
uh, sterilize small devices very, very fast. Okay, so basically those are the heat autoclaves that use moisture, uh, just autoclaves that use gas, chemical gases, okay? And we have other autoclaves that use UV rays, UV lights that kills the pathogens. But the most common ones are the heat autoclaves that use water and it is heated up using electricity or any other heating source. It is pressurized. So the steam gets to a very high temperature, okay? And you're able to kill all microorganisms. When you'll be uh, going for your practicals, if you have not yet seen an autoclave, it's going to be shown to you and they're going to demonstrate how it works, okay? So this is just a basic example showing you a, a basic autoclave. And this is the surface where you put whatever you want to sterilize. You can see here, these are some uh, chemicals. They could be agar that is used for culturing bacteria. You can put here cotton swabs, okay? Uh, forceps, anything that you may want to sterilize can withstand moist heat. Remember, there are some things that can crack when they are exposed to moist heat. So whatever is compatible and can be uh, sterilized using moist heat can be put on this surface and you shut this door. And once you switch it on, the steam comes in, okay? And all these items get sterile because all killed. Okay, once the process is complete, you switch off, the steam gets let out. And once it has cooled, you open the door and you get your items, okay? There is internal QC and external quality control, which I'm going to talk about. Some of the common mistakes that people wear ovens and autoclave. So an autoclave uses the moist heat, the steam, while the hot air oven uses dry heat. It is just like the conventional oven that you know of, that you use for baking, okay, in, in the kitchen. But for a sterilization chamber, it's an oven that can go to much higher temperature. Some of the common mistakes is overloading the sterilizer chamber. This is the sterilizer chamber. When you overload it, you pack it too much. The steam cannot sufficiently perfuse through these items between packs, packages, okay? and even get in, and even in a hot air oven chamber, it should not be too packed. Make sure there's sufficient spacing between packages or between items, okay? So lack of separation between packs. In correct packaging material, it can be, I keep mentioning cotton swabs, which are commonly used in the lab and even in, in the hospital setup for whatever processes. And some of these swabs can be wooden sticks. You put a ball of cotton, then you sterilize them. You can make packs of 50 or 100, and then you wrap them. If you wrap them with in, incorrect packaging material, it means the steam will not be able to perfuse the packaging material, okay, to penetrate properly so that the, 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 the cotton swabs get started. Have correct packaging material. And even if the packaging material is correct, do not layer it excessively, okay? Excessive layering of the packaging material will also inhibit penetration of steam or hot air, okay? Close container, not penetrated by steam. Here I'm talking about liquids, uh, uh, agar here, that should be in a container. If there's a seal, a sealant here, it should not be completely or tightly closed because the steam should be able to get in, all right? To heat up that liquid. So do not completely seal. Close container, not penetrated by, by steam. It can be, all right? Opening this door <clears throat> to add in other items before the process is complete. That is wrong. Anytime you start a sterilization process with these heat, heating machines, let it end, let that process end in an item, let the process end, then you start a new process to sterilize a new item. Okay, just a minute, please.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, then malfunction of these timers, either timer malfunction or uh, pressure gauge malfunction. Those are internal QC. You, you have reached 120 degrees or 200 degrees and things that tell you the pressure within the item now is uh, 15 pascals or 10 pascals ETC. If those uh, monitors have malfunctioned, you will not be able to accurately set your device. Internal QCs, then you have external QCs to make sure that your gadget is working well. Okay, so, and that's what I want to talk about now, monitoring sterilization. And here I'm talking about monitoring heat sterilization, either the hot air oven or the autoclave. It's not sufficient to just put in your cotton swabs or whatever you want to sterilize, anything you want to use in theater. Switch the machine on, then when it has cooled down and stopped, switch it off, you pick and you think that it is sterile. You need to have a monitoring system, okay? So three approaches. Many, mechanical indicator, chemical, and biological indicator. Now the mechanical indicators are the internal QCs, internal quality control. These are the indicators that are telling you the device is working properly, okay? Internal quality control, indicators of a device working properly. And these uh, are the printouts that you get for the temperature, for the pressure, ETC, okay? This is not an indicator of sterility. It's an indicator of the mechanical functioning of the machine. If we go by the definition of sterilization, sterilization is a process where you have killed all microorganisms. So having a printout telling you that you achieved 120 degrees is just that. It is just telling you that your machine was able to achieve 120 degrees. It is not telling you that you achieved sterilization of the cotton swab, okay? I hope that is clear. So it's a mechanical indicator of the proper working of the device. The second one are the chemical indicators. Chemical indicators, uh, which are indicators that change color when you have achieved the temperature that you want to achieve. You have certain chemicals that change color from green to red, blue to yellow, ETC, depending on the temperature that they have been exposed to and for what duration, okay? So it is not an indicator of sterility. It is used to show that items have gone through sterilization processes. These chemical indicators are useful for packaged items or items that have been packed. And you want to make sure that Although the machine is telling you that the temperature got to 120 degrees and it ran for 15 minutes, the package that was right at the center of all these different packages, did it actually get to that temperature, okay? Or the cotton swabs that have been layered and wrapped together, did they get to that temperature that has been indicated on the machine? Okay, I hope that is clear. So these are external QCs, okay? used to show you that that item has gone through that sterilization process. And before I talk about biological, let me just show you an example. This is an external QC. It's a Bowie dick tape. It's an autoclave tape. And you use this, if you've gone to theater, if you've gone through theater, or now, if you have not, if you get a chance to, you will see certain items that have this, okay? Uh, this tape around them. So this is how the tape looks like. And it has certain uh, strips here that are heat sensitive, you cannot see them on this, they are white. And that is before the tape has gone through the heat process. After it has gone through the autoclave, you use this tape, you wrap it around items that are going into the autoclave, okay? After the sterilization process is complete, if that item or package got to 120 degrees, then you're going to observe this color change. If there was a malfunction with the heating system, okay? or the perfusion of air or steam was not sufficient, then there is not going to be these black lines. The color change from the colorless to black. You're not going to see it, okay? So this is external QC. These are chemical indicators. We have different uh, indicators out there in the market. This is the autoclave tape. We have some that are in vials, chemical, liquid chemicals, okay? They are all different, but their goal is the same, to show that items have gone through the sterilization process and they change color 
with timed exposure. So that's external QC chemical indicators. The last one are the biological indicators, which are the only indicators of sterility. Now, these biological indicators are made up of vials, okay, test strips or containers that have bacterial spores in them that are included. These vials or containers are included, okay, in this during this process. You can put the vial here. Or if this was a container that has uh, different swabs or forceps, inside this container, you include a vial or a test strip. These test strips, like these strips you see in handbags or containers that have small desiccants, okay? So we have such, such test strips that have small spores of bacteria in them. So you include them within your packages, within them or around them. You carry out your process of disinfection. Once it is complete, you get those vials, okay? and you break them onto agar, agar that supports growth of bacteria, then you incubate. If you do not kill these bacterial spores, they are going to germinate, okay? So it means that the process that you carried out of sterilization did not actually kill the microorganisms that were present because the vials that you included as a quality control standard have actually germinated. The spores that were in the vials have germinated. And if you, you, you incubate them, you inoculate the spores onto the egg, you incubate and they don't grow, there's no germination, meaning you actually managed to kill the spores. That then is a quality control indicator, which is biological, that is an indication of killing microorganisms. Okay, now for certain high level labs like level three, level four labs, where you're trying to decontaminate things before they exit the lab, those are the kind of labs that have this large scale autoclaves. Okay, before they exit, actually for those labs, things don't leave the lab through the door. Okay, they get out through the autoclave. For you, the human being, you will exit through the door, but you will go through a shower. The entry door is different from the exit door. And that exit door has a room where you, you get rid of all the clothes you have put on, you leave them there. Then you go into a shower, you bathe from top to bottom, then you exit where you can put on your street clothes, okay? That is how a level three lab works. For a level four, it's even more strict because it is vacuum controlled. There's a vacuum, there's a pressure system. So the air in that lab cannot even exit into yeah, the environment, okay? So for the items that need to leave that lab, you're processing, you're carrying out different uh, procedures in the lab. For those items now that need to leave that lab, you're done, they need to go through that uh, process where you kill all microorganisms that may be present. So for those autoclaves, they are inbuilt in the wall. You put it and you're going to get those items in the next room when they are now decontaminated, okay? Now, before you get those items, this door on the other side will not open if this biological indicator test has not been passed, okay? So any process that you're doing, you will need to include the biological indicator in it, okay? And then that biological indicator is obtained and we see if you have killed all microorganisms by failure or uh, failure of, to, to observe any germination taking place. And once you have ascertained that, then now you can remove those items. That is the only stamp of sterility. This is the only indicator of sterility because when you go by the definition of sterilization where you have killed all microorganisms, you can actually demonstrate killing has taken place through the bacterial spores. Now, these are not any spores. This is not any spore that you use. This is a standardized spore. They are different. Uh, species of bacteria that can be used. But what is special about them, one is called Bacillus cerotamophilus, is that it is a species of bacteria that can withstand very high heat, okay? So for you to be able to actually kill it, then you have killed all possible other bacterial pathogens and viruses and parasites or fungi that may have been present in your items that you are sterilizing, okay? So it is the standard. If you have been able to kill this spore within this vial, then
than any other virus, bacteria, fungi, parasite that could have been present in those items have definitely been killed. Okay, I hope that is clear. That is why it is referred to as the indicator of sterility, this biological indicator. So there are different types, but the principle is the same. They have a very high uh, level of withstanding very high temperature. And if you're able to kill them in the autoclave, then you have possibly killed all other bacteria. Now, what would happen in instances where you have a positive biological indicator? Positive meaning you have carried out your disinfect, your sterilization process and germination takes place. So actually you did not achieve sterility. What do you do? Okay, are we together class? Yes. Okay, so this is a suggested protocol for management of positive biological indicator, okay? Within the hospital setup, in a hospital, and, and in a big hospital, by the way, this is an entire department, part of the infection control department, the, the department that deals now with sterilization and would have the autoclave ETC, okay? So when you get this positive biological indicator, one, immediately take the sterilizer out of service, like you cannot process any other item from that point where you have a positive biological indicator. Two, if you are the one running this gadget, notify the area supervisor and the infection control department immediately. Three, and very, very important, all items that were processed since the last acceptable biological indicator, since the last negative biological indicator should be recalled. Okay, let me explain that. If you are doing this steril sterilization process this morning, today is Monday, you carried out this process 11 a.m. and you get <clears throat> a positive biological indicator at noon, 12 midday. When the process ends at midday, you get a positive biological indicator. If that was the first process today, okay, any item from yesterday, from yesterday, Sunday evening, from the last acceptable biological indicator, from last evening, if you had a process done, all items from last evening must be recalled. Of course, these ones for today are considered non-sterile because you've got a positive indicator, but the ones from last evening, because you do not want to have that chance that possibly there was something wrong from the last acceptable indicator, okay? So you recall, and that is why all items that go through sterilization must be properly labeled with the date and time, okay? So everyone knows when was this batch of forceps, when were they sterilized? So that if you notice something even three days later, you can efficiently recall what you need to recall, okay? Because you could have sterilized them today, okay? The biological indicator gave you, yes, it, it was negative, but when you're carrying out an outbreak investigation, maybe there's an outbreak of pseudomonas in the world, you realize it is from a group of cotton swabs that came in last week, Friday. So you want to stop using them, okay? So, so if you well, with the date and time, then you're going to be stuck. What is safe, what is not safe? So from the point of the biological indicator, take from the last acceptable negative biological indicator, recall, okay? In case of an outbreak investigation, from the time you notice that there's a problem and you're working backwards also, recall them based on the date and time. Then as soon as possible, repeat the biological indicator test, okay? in three consecutive cycles. Remember, this could be from anything. This failure could be from anything. It could be from not setting the timer properly. Maybe there's a power blackout, okay? So it did not actually run for 15 minutes. It ran for five minutes and there was a blackout for eight minutes. The power came back. So maybe there was a power malfunction, okay? Maybe there was a problem with the supply of steam. All those different supplies, okay, from the energy, ETC or whoever set the timer, all that. So repeat, repeat this biological indicator test in three consecutive sterilizer cycles so that you want to rule out that it wasn't about the, 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 the individual who was running the machine. It wasn't about their error, human error. The error is with the machine, okay? So you carry out three consecutive sterilizer cycles and check to ensure the sterilizer was used correctly. If you have checked all that and you also uh, have checked with the hospital maintenance for any irregularities during the time that you are carrying out the cycle, for example, electrical, 
Okay, then you need to discuss abnormalities with the sterilizer manufacturer. Go back to the source, okay? It could be an engineering fault. It could be something that requires maintenance of that machine. Maybe there's a loose bolt somewhere. So go back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer, usually the people who supply these things carry out maintenance, okay? So discuss these abnormalities. Close down the sterilizer until the manufacturer can assure you that it is operating properly. And once you have got this assurance that it is operating properly, carry out a biological indicator test in three consecutive cycles to make sure it is now okay, it is now safe for use, okay? So that is so much about heat, heat sterilization, which is the most common, the most convenient in a laboratory setup, in a hospital setup, close to theater. These items, hot air oven, autoclave, are very, very convenient for sterilizing heat, uh, items that can withstand dry heat and moist heat, okay? We have other mechanisms or processes for sterilization for things that cannot go through heat. A common one are using these sterilant gases, ethylene oxide, hydrogen peroxide, acetic acid, glyceraldehyde, and formaldehyde are gases that can be used to sterilize heat sensitive items or equipment. There's some equipment exposed to heat, they will be destroyed. You can perfuse them using these gases, okay? In the notes that you're going to receive, I'm going to include, because of time, I'm going to include advantages and disadvantages of each of these gases. Some of them have been documented as carcinogens. Some of them, because of prolonged exposure, they cause hematological changes to the people who are using them, okay? So what are the kind of PPEs that you need to use? And what is the toxicity level of exposure? Or if you sterilize something using ethylene oxide, what do you need to do to that item, okay? To make sure you have gotten rid of all residual ethylene oxide gas, okay? So that is information that I'm going to include in subsequent notes that you will receive on the advantages, disadvantages, and important notes to consider with use of each of these gases. <clears throat> we can also sterilize using ionizing radiation. And this is mainly used in industries, as I said, you can use X-rays, gamma rays, accelerated electrons, ETC. This is destroy microorganisms by interfering with any flake acid material, either DNA or RNA. But they're very, very useful for sterilizing prepackaged single-use items like catheters, urinary catheters, ETC, plastic syringes, needles, surgical blades. Right now, make a point when you go to hospitals, the package you will see there, it's always indicated sterilized using, for example, gamma rays, okay? Prepackaged, single use. Once you break the seal, you cannot reuse it on another patient, okay? Sterilizing using by filtration uh, as a process of sterilization. Special filters made of membrane of a small post size, 0 0.22 micrometers. These are useful for sterilizing uh, heat sensitive liquids. There are some liquids that cannot be sterilized using heat because they contain protein or other materials that would get denatured when exposed to heat. For example, some antibiotic solutions, solutions, antibiotic administered as solutions that would be destroyed when exposed to heat can be sterilized using nitrocellulose membrane. And these are used in pharmaceutical clean rooms, okay, where they're preparing these items. Once they are uh, sterilized by filtration, they are sealed until they can be used. Now we've looked at sterilization and it means the choice is up to you as a, an, an operator or somebody now who wants to sterilize something, okay? But these are some of the factors you'd need to consider. High efficacy, and you can read the, the notes on each bullet. Rapid activity, you don't want things that are taking too long. Strong penetrability. Material compatibility, what is the best method I would use to sterilize this gadget or this item, okay? Nanti to the patient, safety to the operator, and also environmental safety, okay? Organic material resistance, okay? How much organic material is present on this item? For, the, for some of these gases, they really get deactivated with organic material, okay? One like per acetic acid can withstand very high organic matter. So you need to have that in mind if you're using sterilant chemical gases. 
how heavy is the presence of organic material if you don't have and then detergents all right point the arteries and cost effectiveness all factors considered hmm? are you able to afford it okay reasonable cost approach uh, sterilization process or a chemical that you can afford okay don't use three quarter of your budget on one thing something can be cheap but it is just effective okay once you have done your sterilization remember storage is very very important protect sterility until ready to use okay otherwise throw them poorly then by the time you need to use them they will be contaminated keep them covered well protect them from dust moisture keep them on shelves where they are not falling on the floor and make sure you can protect the package integrity they can have seals so once you break the seal somebody knows that you have opened it items as fast in fast out therefore you have to label them properly if you need to have a recall because of a breach or failure in the sterilization process, then you should have properly labeled them with the dates and time. Okay, so that is sterilization. <clears throat> For disinfection, I'll just talk about it in brief. Disinfectants that are available are chemicals. Okay. And for these disinfectants, you really need to be guided by the manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, it is compatible with which kind of material? That is one. Two, what is the optimal dilution percentage, concentration? Okay, more is not always better as I had mentioned, okay? You also need to understand environmental safety issues. Once you have some disinfectant left because some of them you can dilute and you can only use it for 24 hours. Whatever is left is no longer uh, suitable to be used for disinfection. You need to prepare a fresh batch. Some of it, once exposed to, to light, you cannot use it because it, it is not stable like the halogens, sodium hypochlorite, ETC. So when you have some residual disinfectant, how do you get rid of it? Okay, it is chemical waste matter. How do you dispose of it safely? Understand environmental safety issues. For the operators, the people using them to carry out this process, what is the exposure limit? You need to know the permissible exposure levels. And if there's a breach in that permissible exposure level or somebody has been exposed inappropriately, for example, there's a splash, what do you need to do in terms of safety and in terms of treatment because now that would be chemical poisoning all right assess compatibility again that is information that you'd get from the manufacturer so an ideal disinfectant should have broad antimicrobial spectrum okay fast acting non-toxic surface compatibility easy to use orderless in a hospital setup it's better you use disinfectants that do not have any smell don't pick something that is lemon scented or smells like rose flower. Some of those smells can be nauseating to patients. If it is odorless, better, it's better that way. Uh, something that is stable, environmental friendly, and of course, economical for that institution, okay? Some examples of methods of disinfection, I have said the most common are the chemicals and the notes that you're going to receive from me will give you examples of several chemicals, okay? When you get those notes, just broadly classify those chemicals as antiseptics, those that you can use on the skin or on the mucous membrane, and those that you can use on the environment. Remember, if you, if you use sodium hypochlorite, that is bleach used in brands like JIC. If you put it on the skin or, or in your mouth, it is corrosive, okay? Remember what I talked about antiseptics and non-antiseptics. So those are the chemical disinfectants, but we have other methods of disinfection that we can, that have been employed in the in the hospital environment, in research facilities. One is using UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation at 240 to 280 nanometers. We can use lamps that produce this UV rays and they are very, very useful in reducing the number of microorganisms, microbial load in the air. So you can switch on these lamps in the operating theaters, in a room or in a safety chamber, biosafety cabinet chamber where you're processing some specimen like sputum, you can switch on the lamp 
and it's going to disinfect the air around that area, okay? Disinfection by gases, some of those gases I had mentioned before at a lower concentration, you can use them to disinfect complex heat sensitive equipment like baby incubators, anesthetic machines, big rooms, large rooms, okay? You can disinfect them. Complex heat sensitive equipment. You can also disinfect by filtration, okay? And again, this is in reference to air. Think of COVID right now. Um, you may want to contain, um, contain pathogens within a certain room, depending on who is in that room. If it is an isolation room, you don't want uh, pathogens moving through air. So you install HEPA filters in ventilation systems. This is also useful in operating theaters, in pharmaceutical clean rooms, etc. Okay. And this is the long list I had told you. It is not exhaustive. Believe you me, there are over 100 or 200 chemicals that are available right now. Okay. And this has been accelerated by COVID that can be used for disinfection. These are just examples of groups. And under each group, we have specific examples of chemicals, alcohols, aldehydes, biguanides, halogens, phenolics, etc. So <coughs> in terms of categorizing these chemicals, we can just group them based on their strength, okay? The high level disinfectants can, uh, microorganisms that have a higher intrinsic resistance compared to the low level disinfectants. The intermediate level are just that, they're intermediate. So the choice of disinfectants that you'd pick would be guided by the kind of work you are doing, okay? The kind of microorganisms that you suspect you're dealing with, okay? That is one. Then I said you can group them as antiseptics or non-antiseptics. As you'll get these notes when you'll be going through them, these slides and notes uh, with more material to read, please ask yourselves, these chemical disinfectants, can they be used as antiseptics or not? What is their surface compatibility? Because some, some of them can be used on the environment, but can only be used on wooden surfaces or, or metallic surfaces, ETC. So what is their surface compatibility? For some of them, if you pour it into a basin or you touch it with a glove that is made of rubber, the rubber will, will be destroyed, okay? So what is surface compatibility? A very, very important biosafety data sheet for each chemical, okay? So you're going to read these notes. Uh, there are several, there are some slides here giving you examples of chemical agents under each group and where we can use it. For example, isopropyl alcohol, which is commonly used to disinfect the skin before you take blood specimen, okay? And it's optimal at 70%. I'm going to send you uh, a write-up from CDC um, that has very good information on different chemicals, the current chemicals, where they can be used, what is the optimal percentage, what are some of the concerns as far as permissible exposure levels are concerned, toxicity, if somebody is exposed to it in a hazardous way, okay? For example, if somebody consumes a chemical, okay, thinking it is water, what are some of the safety uh, first aid, first aid uh, steps that you'd need to, to take. So that is a lot of material. You can imagine there are over 100, okay? So usually over 100 chemicals out there, you cannot possibly cram all of that, okay? What you need to know are the most common that are used in your environment. You need to know one or two. Of course, you have come across isopropyl alcohol. You have come across formaldehyde or glue glutaraldehyde, you have come across chlorohexidine, you have come across some of these hand washes and hand rubs, okay? Now, I want you to be curious going forward from now on, as you come across these chemicals, please take the bottle and read what is the active chemical in them, okay? Hypochlorite, for example, what kind of chemical is this? Can it be used on the skin? Can it an environment on, on a surface in the in the laboratory. Okay. Iodine present in betadine, tincture of iodine, iodophos, commonly used as surgical scrubs, ETC. What is its strength? What is it, what is its, its advantage and disadvantage? Okay. You can imagine there's so many chemicals, so we cannot start reading through each. Um, I have included what I think are the most common and where they can be used. 
I talked about an infection control team for an organization. Usually that team would give that guidance in sterilization and disinfection policies. And those policies would clearly outline which chemicals are permissible to be used. So the fact that you're an in-charge doctor somewhere, don't just pick something, a chemical from, from the chemist or wherever and decide you're going to use this as you carry out procedure ABC. Be guided because some of those, some of these products are controlled differently depending on the different jurisdictions. For example, I want to point out one here, triclosan. Triclosan, which is an example of a phenolic, it's a very, very good chemical disinfectant, okay? It is actually included in some toothpaste. If you read some toothpaste, they include triclosan. It is used as a chemical in some uh, brands uh, for skin disinfection, etc. However, this agent is banned in some countries. There are several states in America that have banned triclosan because they have documented it in publications to be a, a potential carcinogen, okay? So if you are practicing here and you, you commonly use a certain agent which has triclosan and it works very well for you, then you go to practice in another state, another country, and you are carrying out home care or within that hospital and you decide to buy a certain agent directly from a manufacturer to use in your practice. <clears throat> You can get into trouble because you're using a banned product. So you need to be sensitive, be guided by the infection control team of that organization. As a scientist, a healthcare worker and a medical doctor, be sensitive to what is coming out uh, from research, okay? That if a certain product now has been absolutely banned now by WHO, and because you know, sometimes it's about the level, all these chemicals can be poisons depending on the amount of the concentration. Okay, so using it beyond a certain level now can lead to ABC. So you need to be sensitive and alert to that so that you don't get into trouble, you don't harm your patient, or you don't even destroy your environment. Remember universal health, one health, you're dealing with human beings, but you also need to be sensitive and keep your animals safe and also your environment, your ecosystem also should not be destroyed by what you're doing, okay? There's a balance that needs to be maintained. <clears throat> So you'll, you'll get these notes and other supplementary notes uh, giving you examples of these chemicals. And what I want to point out here as you will be reading those notes, these notes and the supplementary information I will give you about examples of chemicals and what they contain and where they can be used. Whenever you're talking about these chemicals, please talk about the active chemical agent, okay? Talk about the active chemical agent. Don't talk about brand names. So in this state, let me use an example so that I emphasize what I'm saying. You've probably heard of Dettol. Dettol is a very common uh, household, you know, chemical disinfectant, household name in Kenya, within Kenya. You may go to Uganda and they don't know what Dettol is, or may, perhaps they do. Um, if you're giving a presentation or doing a write-up or making a recommendation as part of an infection control team, talk about the active agent. So Dettol, for example, about a chemical name that is universal whether it is in uganda in america in europe anyone can find out what chlorozylenol is and it is one language okay and you don't want to be to get to expose yourself to risk of litigation or being sued by a certain manufacturer or the owner of a certain product by misrepresenting their brand or making certain statements etc you may have carried out some research and you find highly carcinogenic, yet it is being used as a disinfectant for whatever reason. So please address the chemical agent, okay? And then the manufacturer or whoever is using that agent can now take the appropriate ethical steps to reverse their actions or to change, okay? In your write-ups, in your communication, avoid brand names, use, make use, make reference to the chemical agents. Now, when you have an agency like Kenya Bureau of Standards, or the government history of now they are taking certain steps that product A, B, C is should be withdrawn for them from the market. Probably it's because of misrepresentation of facts. Maybe the concentration of chemicals that they contain are not what they are claiming. Maybe there's some risk toxicity level that has been surpassed. There's a risk to the to the individual who would use it to the 
see that. In that case now, because they are informing the consumers who are dealing with a brand, then they can mention a brand name. So they can tell you we have banned products A or we have banned products B, okay? As a scientist, refer to the chemical name. So two important tests are, uh, two tests are very important as far as chemical disinfectants are concerned. One is the manufacturer's test and, and whatever tests they're doing to give you the optimal concentration, all the information that they contain and present in the manufacturer's biosafety data sheet is the manufacturer's test. Once they are done with those tests and they have their write-up, they present that to the quality control body, Kenya Bureau of Standards, for example, that now will take that chemical and subject it to their own tests to see if what the manufacturer is, is stating is true. If the manufacturer says that this chemical can kill all microorganisms, all here, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, etc., at 70%. Now, KB, Kenya Bureau of Standards, or any other quality control standards will find that, will, will carry out that test to make sure that is true, okay? And what is the safety level? The in-use tests are tests that are conducted within individual organizations or institutions to find out the performance of these disinfectants over time. Once you have diluted it to 70%, it, it will remain effective for how long, okay? Is it for 24 hours? Is it for one hour? Is it for seven days? So how often do we need to make a fresh batch of samples? Okay, what is the rate of kill? Okay, what is the risk of contamination of the batch that you prepare? So you can decide as an infection control team of a certain organization, how often do we need to prepare a fresh batch of disinfectant in our surgical wards, okay? In theater, in, in the, the station where the nurses are doing triage, taking temperatures when the patients walk in, how often do we need to change those chemical disinfectants, okay? How should we store them, all right? This is the in-use test. All in-use tests must be determined by the infection control team. Um, this was just a, a, a small example just to highlight to now bringing all this information together, this disinfection and sterilization processes. One, when we are in the hospital or you as doctors, you are using different gadgets. For example, an endoscope, you can use an endoscope. And this is something that can be reusable, used from one patient to another. So between the two patients, you need to process it, take it through the process of disinfection or sterilization, depending on spalding classification, which we have looked at, okay? So for example, an endoscope, this is just one example of an item that can be re reused and therefore would need processing. One, you clean it using an enzymatic detergent, okay? Then you disinfect it using high-level disinfectants. Remember, an endoscope gets into contact with the mucous membrane, all right? And that has the uh, semi-critical classification according to spalding. So if you could sterilize this very well, but if you cannot use high level disinfectant, then you rinse it using sterile or filtered water followed by an alcohol rinse. Then you dry it using forced air, okay? And you store it vertically in a safe place, free from dust, moisture, etc. Okay, until you can use it, then you go through this process again. This is one example of reprocessing of a medical item, okay? A patient may be concerned you know, you're using something that was used by another patient previously. And yes, you can actually show them or the infection control team can have this as their SOP, which you need to follow stepwise, okay? You do not by bypass any step when you are reprocessing a medical item. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm just going to go into infection control in brief, but in conclusion, these sterilization and disinfection policies are uh, put down by the infection control team <clears throat> in health institutions. Health institutions can be hospitals, you know, diagnostic centers, research facilities, etc. Now, policy formulation must be multi-departmental. Think of all the healthcare cadres, okay? The doctors, the nurses, the laboratory people, the porters, you know, the, the records departments, sterilization and disinfection policy formulation must be multi-departmental because the way the hospital works or a research facility, it's like a cog. It is like a factory belt, okay? One, one group contributes to the other and the other also facilitates 
facilitates the other's work and the other. If one person or one department is not playing their role appropriately, whether it is the nurse or the doctor or the laboratory technologist, okay, or the records person or your frontline staff, if somebody or the cleaners, if someone is not playing their role, you're going to have a problem, okay, with infection control. This is important for safety of the patients, safety it is necessary for validity and accuracy of lab diagnosis. If it is a doctor taking the clinical specimen from the patient, which the nurse will receive, okay, and take to the lab or the laboratory technologist will come and pick and then process. Think of this doctor from the time this blood sample, for example, is being taken, drawn from this patient. If there's a problem with the syringe or the needles, is a problem with the disinfectant alcohol that they're using to swab the skin. Huh? So the specimen is contaminated, okay? The nurse receiving it, there's a problem with, with, with uh, putting the specimen in the right place. It's being transported to the lab, okay? The, the agar that is being used to process the blood, to culture the blood, the petri dishes, if they are contaminated, the laboratory technologist does not observe sterilization and disinfection. Finally, the report that this patient of yours is getting, that we have isolated Staphylococcus aureus from the blood, that is a false report and is going to interfere with proper management of the patient. It can actually lead to death of your patient because of failure in proper disinfection and sterilization. So it is very, very important, validity and accuracy of your lab diagnosis and ultimately management of your patient, okay? Now this discussion, you know, this was two lectures combined in one, sterilization and disinfection is usually a lecture on its own, infection control is a lecture on its own. So I'm just going, to, uh, because I'm seeing it's going, just getting to one o'clock. Are we together? Or I've lost you, some have stepped out for lunch. Yeah, we are together. Are we still together, MBC? Okay, so I'm just yep. going to talk about infection control. Okay, I'll talk about infection control in brief, but it's a very important uh, discussion and maybe at another time I'm going to elaborate more about it. With COVID, you know, the general public is sensitized a lot with infection control because, so we are thinking about infection control. You as a doctor, you think about infection control within the community. And maybe that would be mainly a public health microbiologist specialist, but your patient is coming from a community. And as you're taking the history of your patient, there are certain aspects that you get from this patient. Sometimes based on what they would tell you, you need to raise a red flag and go back into the immediate community to institute some, some containment measures, okay? You realize you're dealing with a patient with a certain condition. This is disease X, it is notifiable and their contacts have to be immediately traced and brought in, okay? So that goes back to the community. And then now within the hospital, you also need to institute proper infection control. You don't want to get sick as a doctor. You don't want your nurses to get sick. You don't want other health workers. You don't want other patients to be exposed and infected with this new disease that is coming in, with these patients that you are currently dealing with or, or, you've, or you've currently diagnosed. So infection control goes back to the community and also has to be handled within the hospital, all right? So with this infection or that disease that you're dealing with, you need to understand its epidemiology very well if you want to control its spread, okay? What is the natural cause of that disease? What is the frequency? Is it possibly going to cause an outbreak? Are you looking at a possible epidemic, okay? What are the patterns of disease occurrence within that particular community or within a certain age group? Okay, is there a certain pattern of disease occurrence? Most importantly, what are the risk factors for potential causes of disease? Who is at risk, okay, of getting this disease? And then what are the preventive measures that we need to evaluate? So you understand your disease so well. When you understand its natural cause, it means you know its habitat, you know its mode of transmission, you know its pathogenesis, you know its clinical manifestations, how it presents, okay? So that when you're initiating preventive measures, you know your target points, okay? And now when you have your preventive measures initiated, what is the effectiveness? It is not enough to just roll out certain projects, programs, 
then you go away. You need to know how effective are those preventive measures because you may need to change, okay? So just think about, look at this picture within the hospital. This is within a hospital setting in a ward, a general ward. So you have two patients, okay? We have the doctor, we have your nurse here and you have your visitor. This could be a visitor to this patient here, okay? And just think of the likely risk of infection, something coming from this patient who is colonized by a certain pathogen, okay? And the chances of contamination occurring, spread occurring through contaminated equipment, through the hands of staff and visitors. You see this visitor on their phone and they gave this phone to their patient to talk to their wife back at home or to their child, then they get it. The phone is contaminated as they walk through you know, maybe say hi to this patient or touch this bed railing. You know, microorganisms, as I, as I told you when we began this thing, in sterilization, disinfection, infection control, think about it with microscopic brain or look at things with a microscopic eye. If you are to put a microscope in front of your eyes or a lens, you know, those things you used to do in, I don't know if you people did home science, but yes, when you move around with a lens, you'd actually see things, the invisible world, is more dangerous than the visible world, okay? Invisible in terms of germs. These shared facilities from this patient, all these can be sources of infection to another patient. Of course, worst case scenario, it's, it's even better dealing or easier dealing with these things that you can touch. What would be worse would be something in air, okay? So this patient is breathing things, exhaling some pathogens, that the, all these people are breathing, including this patient. This guy and this lady and this gentleman will eventually go back home or will take the bus or will get into their car, go back to his office, to a factory or anywhere. So just think about, you know, an outbreak. When COVID started, you probably and other people who are not medics, you know, got sensitized to contacts, contacts of an individual. And that contact could be because of breathing the same air. Because of that, sometimes you need to initiate isolation facilities. So knowing this is a colonized patient or exposed to a certain pathogen, from the moment they walk into the hospital, when the nurse is taking blood pressure, triage, nini, and you realize, oh, I'm dealing with a possible colonized person or someone who is exposed to condition X or to pathogen X, it could be COVID or any other thing. <clears throat> what do I need to do? This patient has TB, they are coughing. How do I need to handle this patient as a doctor, as a nurse? How do I protect this other patient? Who can sue me because they just came in with malaria and now they have TB because I put them there with TB patients, okay? They can sue me and really I'm, I'm increasing risk of, you know, mortality and increased hospital stay because of poor infection control. So when you have this picture in mind, I just want you to be really sensitive as a doctor training to be doctors when you breathe when you touch okay as you walk into this hospital you're breathing we are all you know in a in a swimming pool you'd be really really sensitive if somebody put a color sensitive dye and if somebody peed in the water the water changes color around them you'd be really sensitive you'd react as far as air is concerned you really don't know when you walk into a room and someone is seated there you're breathing even your consciousness is 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 heightened and you know that okay this is actually a place where we have patients who would have all possible things what can i do as far as infection control is concerned so think about your air masks are a very very good thing now we, we didn't used to we were we never used to have them uh, as an everyday thing in the past but now we do and they are very very good if you think about it so think about touch, okay, touching surfaces. Think about shared equipment. Think about shared facilities. What do you need to do, okay, to break that chain of transmission? All right. Um, I don't want to rush through this because it's an interest. It's, it's an important, not just interesting, an important uh, topic. When I meet you next, I'm going to discuss uh, infection control at length, but I just want to slide because my discussion was going to look at and infection control 
surgical site infection and how you need to because when somebody goes into surgery there's that increased risk of possibly coming down with another infection you know you have a wound in this patient um, patients who are on ventilator ventilatory support have a risk of getting pneumonia hospital acquired pneumonia okay bloodstream infections right from the time you're taking blood you know you're getting into and somebody who has a venous catheter that is somebody who has a high risk of getting infection. So those are the areas I wanted to focus. And, and then of course, uh, diarrhea, something that can easily spread within the hospital setup, okay? Right from patients who have uh, diarrheal disease, for example, cholesterol disease, or a patient who develops diarrhea within the hospital setup. How do you control and make sure other patients do not come down with uh, diarrhea? Okay, these are some of the precautions that I wanted us to discuss. But what, we are, what I'm going to do, because we've, we've run out of time, I'm going to share these notes. You will read them, okay, each of those points. Then when we meet, we will discuss. But I just want to look at this in summary, these key points, okay, for infection control. One is education and training of healthcare staff. You've seen the different categories that we are going to look at when we meet next. But in summary, education and as far as infection control is concerned, very, very important. Better compliance with hand hygiene, care of indwelling lines, catheter care, and aseptic techniques. So this comes with training of infection control, okay? Good antibiotic prescribing, okay? That is another uh, group that we are going to look at. Because control, you can have antibiotic uh, associated or related diarrhea, okay? And how do we deal with that? Hospital cleanliness, proper consultation. Remember, I talked about policy being interdepartmental, proper disposal of clinical waste, proper laundry services for all used hospital linen of the appropriate ventilation system, okay? Positive pressure to prevent entry of microorganisms and negative pressure in laboratories, for example, to prevent escape of pathogens from the rooms, okay? Use of HEPA filters or other. Uh, ventilation system across all hospital departments. So having SOPs, and these SOPs are usually established by infection control committees. Okay. MBCHP2, finally, sorry to rush you about this infection control. As I've said, we will have a recap on, on this. Surveillance plays an important role in infection control and surveillance may be active where you are actually putting in effort to collect data or passive where you are using routine data that had been collected in the different departments, okay? And the aim of surveillance is to keep infection to a minimum level and to prevent an outbreak or so a good surveillance system should be simple, flexible. It should be acceptable to the population being studied. Okay, remember this can be your colleagues, can be nurses, can be the lab. So they should be they should accept the surveillance system and understand why it is important. Okay, it should be sensitive, representative, timely, and have a reasonable. It is important. So whatever you get in your surveillance, you need to give that that data that you collect back to who is concerned about it and that will make them more willing to take part in future so the doctors the nurses all other people need to know the kind of data you collect okay so that they can in initiate corrective measures where correction needs to be uh, implemented now surveillance is a circular process that involves data collection and i've said data collection can be active or passive it involves analysis of that data 
okay, interpretation of that statistics, then provide the information to the actual staff, distribute that information for action. Sometimes that action is managerial or administrative, okay? You need to tell people we don't have enough PPEs. This chemical is not working well, okay? It is not sufficient. That is something that maybe procurement or administration needs to do. And that's why I said it is multi-departmental. Even then they need to be involved in the infection control. So the procurement team must understand when you tell them we don't want to use chemical X, they know that you don't want to use it because it is not helpful, it is not working, it is not uh, suitable for your work, okay? Not because they want it procured because it is the cheapest or they want to give that supply to somebody, etc. So let everyone be involved. So the appropriate action can be initiated. And then surveillance needs to be continuous, okay? Surveillance needs to be continuous for it to be properly effective. Don't stop your surveillance. You need to be on toes always as far as infection control is concerned, okay? So um, MBCHP, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've rushed you through this last bit of infection control, but as I've said, I'm going to recap on that. And I'm actually, I've run out of time. Sorry. I've, I've run out of time with the, my next class as well. I'm seeing there are quite a number of, of questions. There are quite a number of questions. Um, let me have this on the direct messages and I will address them once we meet. My other class is waiting. So when we meet, um, we'll start with infection control so that I go into the individual subgroups of the infection control, the different um, sections I wanted us to focus on. There are people asking for the notes. Definitely I'm going to email them. Through your, is this the class email MBCHB2 2020? Yes, I'm going to send these notes to, to this class email, as well as two documents that I want you to read on infection control and on sterilization and disinfection, the different chemicals and processes that are available. They are quite large. So please just uh, have them as resource, reference resource material for you, okay? Okay, so thank you for your time. Unless there's anything burning, allow me to stop the meeting so that I can start a different class and then we'll pick up from this when we meet next.